Well, hey, everybody, welcome to Where You Are Church. I'm Pastor Dave. It's so good to be able to bring the word and be with you today. I am so excited for the last message in our series, Salt and Light. But before we jump in, it's time to worship with our tithes and our offerings. So I don't know if you've been following us on social media. I know many of you do, or if you get our emails, but we sent out a little special message this past week about something that we intend to do as a church in partnership with our local church partners to make an impact far beyond our walls and our doors in areas like North Carolina that have been recently affected by Hurricanes Helene and Milton. So if you haven't seen that message yet, I wanna show it to you right now. Okay, we've all seen the devastation, the hurt and the pain that Hurricane Helene has wreaked in North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. As a local church, we've already placed more than $30,000 on the ground to bring some relief and some hope to this community. Now, I'm personally devastated by what's happened to so many communities that mean so much to me. I'm concerned to hear that the federal government has announced that it will not have the money to help if another storm or disaster occurs. This is just unacceptable. So to the best of our ability as a church, we're announcing a plan to be part of the solution in the name of Christ. And here's that plan. Over the next two weeks, we plan to give away 50% of everything that comes in with tithes and offerings. We plan to bank most of that money so that we're prepared to respond when the next storm hits. Now, let me tell you, this is nothing new for our church. We're used to giving away 10% of everything that comes in. But because of this moment and the urgency of this crisis, we're raising the bar to 50%. Now, we want everyone connected to New Life to give at their highest level over the next two weeks. While I'm somewhat confident that the federal government will find a way to come through, I'm absolutely confident that our God will. Mm. We would also encourage every church that hears this to join us in being ready on your own to respond. Governments come and go, but God's church lasts forever. We must prepare to be the voice of hope in even the darkest of times. Now, may God bless you, may he keep you, and may he guide you as you prepare to respond and to give. Thank you. Well, amen. I I hope that this is a call for you to participate in some way, any way, to help us make an impact in these many devastated areas and the many lives that are struggling right now. So um, once again, if you've never participated before, it's very easy. We have it right here on the screen. All you have to do is text in the number 94000. So just text us at that number and send the word WIAC gives, all one word, W-Y-A-C gives, and you can give any amount. And when you do, half of that is going to be donated in this way. Um, and of course, if you want to partner um, or be a supporter or a tither, that's totally up to you. We have many people that choose to do many different things. Bottom line is this, we're very grateful for your support, however, and at any level that it's at. And we just believe that God is using it to do great things in the earth. But y'all, it is time now to worship through the word. So we're in our last message in the series, Salt and Light, and I am so delighted. I got to start us in this series just, what, five weeks ago, and um, just a little recap, we're in Matthew chapter 5, and we were looking at verses 13 through 16, and what I want to do just to start us off is open the Word of God. I just want to jump right in and hear Jesus' words, the words that make me more than anything else feel connected to God. When Anytime Jesus speaks, anytime I read his words, it's like I just come alive, and I know that's the same thing for you. So let's come alive a little bit right now, and let's turn to these letters in red. In my Bible, in Matthew chapter 5, 13 through 16, it is read and it says this, You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds. Put in the chat, good deeds. Everybody say to your neighbor, good deeds. That they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. That's the word of the Lord. So I open this whole series up by making a few really important observations about what this passage means. 
The first observation I made is that salt and light, they're metaphors, but they're when used together, when they overlap, they can only mean one thing in Jesus's mind. And it's that he's trying to get us to think about the covenant that God has made with his people. That's what he wants above all else. So that's the first observation. The second one is that we are the salt and light. Well, that's kind of confusing. I thought he's talking about the covenant. He is. He's talking about us being the beneficiaries and the bearers, the, the signposts, the billboards I shared of this covenant to the earth. That's the second thing I shared. And then the third, the last thing is that we invite people into God's covenant by our good deeds. That's why I had you put good deeds in the chat because that's the way that we show people that God's covenant is real. We live it out. We're bearers of it. We don't just show people it. We don't just write it on our forearms or wear t-shirts that say it, although we do those things too. We actually live it out. We do things that matter, that change lives, that impact people. We do good deeds. So those were the things that I shared. And over the last four weeks, you've gotten a chance to hear twice from Pastor Mike, twice from Pastor Theo about, about how to do this, right? So we talked about being how we illuminate, how we salt, we salty and lit people, amen? We salty and lit people, how we illuminate, how we preserve, and then how we restore. This is just elements of how salt works and how light works, right? But it's also how we as Christians make an impact, how we share the covenant with people. So there's just one last message left, and it's that we liberate. All right, so just turn to somebody, put in the chat, we liberate. Go ahead and say it, we liberate. Go ahead and just put in the chat, we liberate, because that's what we kind of want to focus on at the end here. This is one of the most important parts is that by, by being the salt and light, we liberate. And I wanted to go to probably one of the most salty and lit people to ever live besides Jesus, y'all. And that's the Apostle Paul. I wanted, I wanted to go to some texts that would kind of show us more about what it's like when you live like Jesus, when you're salty and you're lit. And the Apostle Paul came to mind, especially some stories in Acts chapter 16, verses 11 through 34. So go ahead and turn there. If you have your paper Bible, go ahead and just leaf open. If you've got your digital Bible, go ahead and glow it up. Come on, I want to see them. Go ahead and uh, anybody in the room that's watching with me right now, go ahead and show me the glow. Show me the glow. All right, all right, you're ready. You're, you're there. You're good to go. If you're ready in the chat, go ahead and say ready. Go ahead and type it in. But we want to read this together, and I want to show you three really different examples of how we liberate when we are the salt and light. Amen? So if you're ready, go ahead and say ready. All right, let's go ahead and jump in. It says in verse 11, from Troas, we put out to sea. We sailed straight for Samothrace. And the next day we went on to Neapolis. And from there we traveled to Philippi. Everybody, Philippi is a really important place. Keep that in mind. We're going to come back to that. Which is a Roman colony and the leading city of that district of Macedonia. And we stayed there several days. And on the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. And we sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. One of those listening, verse 14, watch this, was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Lydia. Everybody say Lydia. She's a dealer in purple cloth. Pause right there. This clues us in to who, the kind of person that she is. See, Luke is the man writing the book of Acts. Luke is a doctor in the closest thing in this time to like a historian, in the way that we think of historians. He's very detail-oriented. He wants us to know little details. He tosses them in from a little while. At this point in the story, you've noticed that the language has gone, if you've read Acts before, you know that it's very impersonal, but now it's saying that we traveled together or that we went outside. In other words, Luke is cluing us in that he's not just the author, he was present for this. So he was actually there when this was being written and he's telling us that he's part of the story. He's an actor in this narrative. And so we're, we're clued in to the type of person Lydia is because she's a dealer of purple cloth. Purple cloth was something worn by royalty. Rich people would have worn purple cloth. So we're clued in that she's probably wealthy herself. She's clearly running a business, which we know takes a certain level of intellect and skill and work hard kind of attitude, right? She's taking care of her family. She probably has it all together. This is a kind of person, y'all, who has it all together. Do you know anybody who just seems to have it all together? 
right? Do you know anybody who just seems like everything's going right in their life and they've just got it figured out? In my view, that's kind of how Lydia is in this story. I want you to think of her as someone who's got it all together. They've got it figured out. But the next phrase tells us a little bit more about her, that she's a worshiper of God. You see that right there in verse 14? She's a worshiper of God. Now, when you and I read that, what do we think about? We're like, oh, well, I'm a worshiper of God too. And I know lots of people who are worshipers of God. But when Luke is using this phrase, he's teaching us something a little bit more. He's telling us that she's not a Jew, but she's interested. She's, she's warm to the God of the Jews, but she's not fully committed. Like she's coming to, the, to pray, all right? She's, she's engaging somewhat. She's spiritually warm. She's open, but she's not committed. She has not become Jewish. She has not adopted the religion. You see how that looks? Do you know anybody? Okay, here we go again, right? Do you know anybody who's spiritually warm, who's warm to spiritual things, but hasn't committed, right? I love the quote from G.K. Chesterton, who says that the mind is like an open mouth. It eventually needs to close on something. Have you ever heard that phrase before? I feel like She's kind of like that. Her mouth hasn't closed on anything. She's open. Maybe you know somebody like that who's, oh yeah, I like spiritual things. And then on the next, the next phrase might be a cuss word. Or maybe they're, they haven't really, they don't have any spiritual disciplines or they're warm to church. They'll say, oh yeah, I'll go to church with you, but that you know that they won't go again if you don't invite. You know what I'm saying? Maybe we all know people like, I think that Lydia is like this. And I might be reading into it too much, but let's just imagine it for a minute. But watch the next phrase. This is the part I want you all to lean in for. And it says that the Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's what? Type it in the chat. Paul's message. Now, at the beginning, we see that he's just sitting down and speaking to the women who are gathered there, right? And that now the next phrase says that they were listening to what he was saying. So she's listening. But then in a minute, it's called a message. And here's what I, this clues us into something. Paul isn't just having a regular old conversation. He's not just shooting the breeze. He's not just finding out information about their lives. This isn't just bumping into somebody on the subway or the metro or on the park bench and being like, oh, what do you do for work? This is something different. Paul, everybody watch this. Paul is being salty and being lit. Why? Because he's evangelist. He's a missionary. He is only in Philippi, not to be a tourist or to go shopping. He's not looking for purple cloth. He's looking for this woman's soul and he wants to save it. And he's, in a, he's preaching the gospel. What he's doing is sharing a specific set of information. It's not just like, oh, I go to church or, oh, I saw something happen. He's actually sharing with them the content of the gospel, which is what, everybody? That Jesus Christ is God and that he came to earth as a man, died on the cross for our sins, rose from the grave, is alive forevermore, and anybody who repents of their sins, puts their faith in him, will be saved and have eternal life. Amen? That's what Paul is sharing here. And what happened when he preached that? What happened to Lydia? The Lord opened her heart to believe. Wow. To receive, to respond, depending on your translation. He, she responded to it. And this is the point. This is the first thing I want to teach everybody tonight is that freedom must be proclaimed. Amen. Freedom must be proclaimed. The gospel must be proclaimed. I like to, call, I like to say, pass the salt. You ever been at dinner time and, you know, with a bunch of people and, and the salt's over here and you can't quite reach it and you just could be like, hey, pass the salt. We got to be, look, the salt is the gospel. It's what flavors. It's what transforms the dish. It's what makes all the difference. We talked about this weeks ago. We need to be passing the salt. We got to declare and proclaim the freedom. Look, it's not just good enough to just live free in front of other people. Like what good is it to go to the prison cell and stand in front of people and just live before them without sharing anything with them. It doesn't do anything. You can't just demonstrate freedom. You should, but you can't just demonstrate freedom and then expect people to know how to get free like you. You have to share with them propositional truth, words, the truth of the gospel in order for them to understand, respond, and be changed. And y'all, when we proclaim it, watch this, God will do the work in their hearts. 
Isn't that good news? Don't you put so much pressure on yourself? I do. I know I do. I do. I did before I even got up here. I'm going to be honest. I put a lot of pressure on myself about how I said this, about what I said, the content of this message. And I'm just thinking if I say it right, perhaps maybe just maybe somebody will be changed when they watch it. But guess what? I'm putting way too much on myself because ultimately, friend, no matter how persuasive or eloquent or words I use or, or what I say, no matter how good it is, how effective it is, ultimately, it's God that's going to change your life and your heart. It's him that's going to transform your heart. It's him that's going to help you receive. It's him doing the work. And it's ultimately up to you, too, to respond and to make the choice. And that's what she does here. She responds. And here's what I want to tell you, friend, and everybody that's listening and watching. Sometimes people are just one conversation away from being transformed forever. Isn't that exciting? Isn't that just, doesn't that just well up hope in your heart? Like Lydia was sitting there, one conversation, one message away from having her whole life changed. And I just know that sometimes it's hard for us to have a conversation. Sometimes we feel a huge barrier between having that conversation or just staying silent. How do I know this? Because before I ever became a pastor, I was a salesperson. I did business to business sales for years and years. But when I first started in business to business sales, I didn't do so well. And I, I floundered and struggled for months and months. And I remembered the reason in my heart was like, I just, I'm so nervous that if I, if I ask them to buy something that they're going to reject me. So instead I was just passive. If they didn't ask to buy, I would just say, well, give me a call later and and how many of you all know that that didn't work out so well? Many, many of you business people watching across the screen right now are just shaking your head. Oh, not, not another one, right? You got to ask. But I didn't know that. And it wasn't until one of the real successful salespeople that was around me saw me underperforming and saw that I was a bit discouraged and pulled me aside and said, let me give you a tip. And I'll never forget what he said. He said, if, he said always go for it. They won't decide if you don't ask. Always go for it. If they won't decide if you don't ask. And from that moment on, no matter how disinterested I thought they seemed, all right, no matter, no matter how out of my league I felt because they were so smart, so successful, you know, were in charge of so much, or no matter how, you know, bad I felt my presentation was that it fell short of what my company wanted me to say or that it didn't seem to be interacting with them. No matter how all that shaped up, I just said, no matter what, I'm going to ask at the end for the sale. I'm just going to do it. And would you know that from that moment on, everything began to change in my career. I started to succeed. And what I learned is that no, my judgment about whether someone was interested or not was wrong twice as much as I was right. That I was a pretty bad judge of where people were at in their minds. That me trying to read their mind through their body language wasn't, wasn't working. And instead, if I made the ask, a lot of people who I never thought would say yes did, and a lot of people that I thought for sure were going to buy never did. Because I just wasn't making the ask. And look, we're not out here trying to sell Jesus. Jesus doesn't need to be sold. Look, bottom line, he don't need our help. He's God. But he commands us to do this, and he commands us to have the conversation, to make the presentation. So if there's an ask that we're trying to make, it's to consider our message. And how many of us are passing the buck? How many of us are passing by the responsibility? How many of us are too afraid of rejection or of being considered weirdos that we just say, oh, I'm not going to bring it up. I'm not going to push it. When we're, we're doing the act of God in our minds <laughs> and trying to decide whether or not they're ready or we're putting ourselves first and we're saying we're no, we don't want the rejection. They could be one conversation away. The freedom needs to be proclaimed and we have to be willing to do it, y'all. But let's read on. Because when we pass the salt, when we're willing to do it, good things happen. Because watch verse 15. When she and the members of her household were baptized, watch that. Look, her whole household. She invited us to her home, Luke says. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. Did you know that just several verses later in verse 40, the gathering of all the Christians in Philippi now were at her house. Do you know what a gathering of Christians is called? 
a church. That in that moment, a church was born in Philippi. And did you know that the Apostle Paul later on writes to a great church? He entitled the letter, the letter to the Philippians, because it's the church of Philippi. All of it started right here. Lydia was the first convert in the city, and then she wasn't the last. Her whole family gets saved right after this, and they all get baptized just like that because she was one conversation away, and so was her family. How amazing if we're willing to pass the salt, if we're willing to do the work of sharing this covenant love, this unconditional love, you'll find out that no matter what the appearance on the face of the person you're talking to looks like, that deep down you are looking at somebody who underneath the shame, pain, and unbelief wants unconditional love and wants to be right with God. You can have that on your side and that ringing in your ear whenever you know you need to have the conversation. So turn to your neighbor real quick and say, don't hog the salt. Put it in the chat. Don't hog the salt. Pass the salt, y'all. Whether they look like they want it or not, pass the salt. Watch verse 16. It says, once we were going to the place of prayer, we were met there by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. And she earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. Pause right there. So we just moved from somebody who was spiritually curious, spiritually open, some to somebody completely different. This person is literally in bondage in every way you could imagine, both physically and spiritually. This is true spiritual darkness, y'all. This is very different than what we saw with Lydia. This is how the narrative shifts. It just goes from one thing to the next. These are the people that he really encountered on his journey and that you will really encounter on yours. Verse 17, she followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the most high God who are telling you the way to be saved. I, I said it that way because I imagine it's a mocking tone. I don't know for sure. But what I do know is that this darkness that's within her recognizes the light. And isn't that true? Doesn't the darkness recognize the light? Who is it that more than anybody else? I'm speaking to all those who are believers. And for you that are watching that aren't a believer, consider this for a moment. But who is it that gets made fun of, picked on and mocked and ridiculed and put down the most out of all the religions in the world? The Christians. Could it be that that's because there's a higher power at work that's influencing for evil all over the world and wants to come against the one true religion? To me, that sounds like it's evidence. To me, that sounds like compelling evidence that would bring the validity of Christianity to the forefront. But nevertheless, in this story, darkness recognizes light. And we see that time and time again throughout this, this, this scripture. But then in verse 18, it says, she kept this up for many days. And finally, Paul became so annoyed Y'all, nobody, on, nobody watching knows anything about being annoyed, right? Uh, isn't it, isn't it kind of wonderful to see that one of the apostles was annoyed? Isn't it kind of <laughs> that you're not alone, right? Come on, y'all. You've been annoyed before. You're probably annoyed right now. You might be annoyed at your kids this morning. Maybe that's why you decided to stay at home and watch Where You Are Church, <laughs> because somebody annoyed you too much, right? Don't, why don't you just turn to your neighbor real quick, just for good measure, and just say, you've never annoyed me, Okay. You've never, none of you have ever annoyed me. Isn't it wonderful that the apostle is annoyed here? But you know what the most annoying thing is? The most annoying thing is, is when something that you should have taken care of the first time just keeps popping up. And, and the apostle Paul, he keeps hearing this same phrase from this woman following him around town. And he turns around, it says in verse 18, and he says to the Spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. And at that moment, the Spirit left her. And that brings me to our second point today, that bondage must be opposed. Amen? Bondage must be opposed. I like to say, shine the light. Simple as that. When there's darkness, shine the light. That's how we oppose bondage. Why? Because bondage is often done in darkness and we've got to just shine the light. We've got to shine the light and we've got to deal with it when we see it. I think the Apostle Paul should have dealt with it when he saw it. Right at the first time, right in the first moment it happened, but instead he ignored it. I think he wanted to ignore it. And, and, that, and if he had ignored it, if she hadn't been persistent, then that woman would have stayed in bondage, unfortunately. It's hard for us to know. But how many times have you seen somebody in bondage in some way, shape, or form 
and, and you passed it by saying, it's just not my problem. I know I'm guilty of this and I'm asking legitimately, think about it for a minute. How many times have you seen it? If you're alive living in America right now, you've probably walked by somebody in bondage and figured it's just not my problem. And that's not because you're an evil person. I'm not trying to shame you or make you feel bad, but the reality is, is that all of us know what this is like. We know what it's like to be the Apostle Paul. If she hadn't followed him around, then he probably would have never taken action in this case. And some of us are guilty of the same. But let me ask you a question. Will there be a cost for that for us? Like, will God look at us at the end when we face him and the white throne of judgment? And will he say, you had the means, you had the time, you had the power, but you didn't have the heart? Will, will there be some sort of repercussion for that? I don't know the answer. But I don't even like the question enough that it's made, motivating me to never want that to come up again. Like, like how many times, or how many people do you know, let me ask it this way, how many people do you know that are in bondage to the darkness of their own pride and need you to shine the light of the gospel to set them free? You probably know somebody. Or how many people are in bondage to the darkness of self-destructive apathy and are just kind of letting their lives happen to them instead of taking control and having agency and need you to shine the light of the gospel to set them free? How many people, right, are in bondage to the darkness of a dead religion that only makes them feel good once a week but doesn't change their heart, doesn't change their attitude, doesn't change their actions and need you to shine the light of the gospel in order to set them free? Right? One more. How many people do you know that are in bondage to the darkness of believing that there's something that they're not and need you to shine the light of the gospel in order to set them free? And indeed, there's somebody that you know. And those are just a few. Those are just a few. And a lot of us look at those people and we say, it's just not my problem. One time I got, I got checked on this big time. I had a friend who was dating a girl online, flew her to his house from California. She's there visiting. He brings her to my house on a Thursday or Friday, introduces us, and she's lovely. I'm like, you guys are going to have such a great weekend. It's so good to meet you. I hope this isn't the last time. Great. God bless you all. Days go by. I've had a long day on a Sunday after church. Been at church all day. It's late. It's probably about five, six o'clock, just got home from a day's long day of ministry. Casey is taking care of the kids, getting into the nighttime routine. We've just finished dinner. You know, there's baths. Everybody's getting laid down before bed for school the next morning. Um, And we're both just exhausted, cleaning up and all that. And suddenly there's a knock on the door. I open the door and it's her. Her eyes are wide. Hey, uh, just stopping by, you know, we had such a good visit the other day. I realized I didn't even get to see the whole house. I didn't get to see your basement. Can I come in and see your basement? And I'm like, yeah. And I look behind her and there's my friend standing there, not quite home, looking off into the distance, no expression on, on his face. I immediately like, yeah, come on in. Can you wait right here? I go upstairs. Casey, they're here. Something's really wrong. She wants to go see the basement. It's a cover. I don't know what for. You need to get down here. The kids aren't done. She's like, I'll stick them in the rooms, you know. So I go back downstairs. I said, Casey will be right down. She comes down, brings the girl to the basement. There, my friend and I are alone in my living room. I look at him. I said, you all right, bud? Nothing. Doesn't speak a word. Look at me. He's just standing there like no one's home, y'all. Anybody else get chills? I'm telling, I get chills all over again. I say, stay right here. I go downstairs. I'm like, I can't believe I just left that guy in my living room. My kids are upstairs. I go downstairs. What is going on? She's freaking out, crying and shaking uncontrollably. We were at his house. Somebody made some sort of unkind joke to him. And he went upstairs. We didn't hear from him. And then all of a sudden we heard in the voice of a little child, I'm going to kill myself, spinning around on a chair. She said, I didn't know what to do. I told him to come with me, and I drove him here. I'm terrified. I want to go home to California. I've called my parents. They're getting me a flight. I was like, wow, okay. And in this moment, I'd like to say that I went upstairs 
looked him in the face and said, in the name of Jesus, come out of him. But instead I got on my cell phone and I called somebody that I knew had done that before. And I said, you need to get over here and take care of this person because he's not my problem. That's what I actually did. And you know what they said to me? They said to me, he's there. You have everything you need. He is your problem. And I'm not going to come help you. Trust Jesus and go and deal with this now. And they hung up on me. (laughs) Woo! And in that moment, I realized I had been selfish and I was afraid. And that's really where it came from. I didn't want it to be my problem. Yes, but whoever does. But in that moment, I realized that God had put him in my house, that God had given me this responsibility. So with great fear, but faith at the same time, I did it scared. I think that's the definition of bravery in that moment, at least all I could muster. I said, come with me. We got in my car. I drove him to the church because I wasn't about to, I didn't want all that to go down in the house. I didn't know what was going to happen. And got to the church. My best buddy was there to meet me. We we're both leaders in, um, in the youth ministry and young adult ministry. And for the next three hours, told that thing to come out of him in the name of Jesus. And would you believe that somewhere around three hours in, something broke off of him. Tears started to flood out of his face and his eyes. He broke down on the ground, started to cry out to Jesus. And from that moment on, went on to be a completely changed man. He has never been the same. He was, was pursuing this one career path, went on to pursue ministry, went on to get his doctorate in, in um, theology and divinity. I mean, and is doing great things and is a man of God. He was radically transformed in a minute because, not because I'm awesome, but because Jesus wanted that darkness opposed. He wanted that bondage broken. And I needed to be the salt and light in that moment because God chose me for that moment. And how many of y'all know that he's going to choose you for those moments too? And that if that moment hasn't come, if you haven't been in a situation like that, that day will come. And you will be in a situation like that. And you have everything you need in Christ Jesus, our Lord, to take care of it, to oppose the darkness, shine the light, and set somebody free. Amen? But you know what? Even if you don't have the discernment, even if you don't know how to handle something like that, if you preach the gospel... God will do the work. But know that whenever you oppose bondage, friends, it will try to fight back. Watch verse 19. Go to the text again. It says, when her owners realized that their hope of making money was gone, and everybody watch this, (laughs) they messed with their money, right? If you ever want to find out the character of a person, mess with their money. If you ever want to find out if somebody's sanctified and believes in Jesus, just mess with their money a little bit and see what happens, okay? See what comes out of that person, all right? (laughs) From the abundance of the wallet, the mouth speaks. Amen. That's not how that verse goes. But they messed with the money. So these guys get upset because now they can't make money on this slave. Horrible. So they seize Paul and Silas. They drag them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They bring them before the magistrates and they say, these men are Jews and they're throwing the city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. Notice there's nothing about their little business issue mentioned. The crowd joins in in the attack against Paul and Silas and the magistrates offered or ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods, y'all. And after they had been severely flogged, everybody take note of that word, flogged, they they went a little bit further than rods. This was a passion beating. This is the same instrument that was used to whip Jesus. This is strands coming off of a like a whip with strands and pieces of of sharp objects of various kinds woven in so that it would be the very effective at ripping the flesh off of whoever it struck they flogged them for this throw them into prison and it says the jailer was even commanded to guard them carefully and when he received these orders he put them in the inner cell he fastened their feet in the stocks but watch verse 25 At about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly, all of the sudden, everybody put in the text, in the chat, 
all of the sudden. Say to your neighbor, all of the sudden. I love this. There was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken and at once all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. Hallelujah. I want you to, I want to teach us. We've got to be salty and lit in every circumstance, y'all. We got to be salty and lit in every circumstance, every circumstance. Look at this circumstance, right? This is all about what it means to be covenant bearers, okay? We don't just bear the covenant when we've heard a good sermon and we leave church and we're good for a few hours until somebody cuts us off in traffic. Come on. We, we got to be salty and lit covenant bearers even when stuff is going wrong because, come on, that's actually the biggest witness that Jesus is real. And that in those moments when things are at the worst of the worst, we still give him glory, honor, praise, dominion, worship, our hearts, our time, attention, effort, everything. We look to him for it all. That's what they're doing, bleeding from God knows where on their body, in the midst of a prison, wrongfully accused. And yet they're singing and God honors it because watch what happens when we do this. Watch what happens when we stay lit and salty. It says that the jailer wakes up in verse 27. He sees the prison doors open and he realizes something really bad for him has happened. So he draws his sword. He's ready to plunge it into his own gut because he knew he was going to get put to death and tortured for his failure because he thought they had escaped. In verse 28, Paul shouts and says, no, 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 don't harm yourself, because he understands. He's a Roman citizen after all. We're all here. Look around. We're all here. And the jailer calls for lights. He rushes in, and he sees that they are there, and he falls trembling before Paul and Cyrus, Silas, and he says, he says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they reply, believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your whole household and they spoke the word of the Lord to him there's another point right there right that you've got to say the word of the Lord every time and to him and all the others in his house and at that hour of the night remember this is after midnight now the jailer he takes them home he washes their wounds and then immediately he and all of his household right then were baptized y'all he was so ready to get saved that he didn't even bother to get dinner cooked he just baptized let's get baptized right now we'll get we'll dinner in a minute we're going to get baptized right now. That was his priority. And then he set a meal before them. He was so filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household, y'all. Praise the Lord. In the midst of being beaten, bleeding, being flogged, being wrongfully accused and thrown into prison, they were still the salt and light. Y'all, wouldn't that be tough? Wouldn't that be so incredibly hard? How would you be feeling in that moment? Be real, be honest. Like if you were just disrupted right now, somebody marched into your house, pulled you into prison for something you didn't even do, would you be sitting there praising and singing hymns? I'm doing a little check on my heart right now myself, and I'm, I don't know. I got a bit of a question mark. I want to say that I would, but I want it from my heart of hearts. I want it to flow out from my heart. I want, it, I want it to be who I am and I want it to be who we all are. I want to be the kind of bearer of the covenant, the salty lit Christian that can't help but praise, can't help but pray, can't help but witness, can't help but tell people about the truth, y'all. That's what I want above all else. That's what I want for you because here's the thing. When we do that in the worst of the worst, right, God not only liberates the people around us, it doesn't just get everybody in everybody's house saved, right? That happens. But it also liberates us, both literally and physically or metaphorically. What do I mean? Literally, God can jailbreak by earthquake. How cool is that? Like in the movies, it's often TNT or C4. They blow the jail open and everybody runs out. And Jesus is like, no, nah, I got earthquakes. I'm good. He jailbreaks with earthquakes. But he, he can change your circumstance instantly when we praise him in the midst of the worst. He can do anything. He can heal your disease. He can change your debt situation. He can get you in a safe position away from danger. He can do any of those things. He's capable of it all. But not only will he liberate you physically, he can also liberate you metaphorically. What do I mean? When you praise him in the midst of it, your circumstance may not change, but if it doesn't, he'll give you a new heart, a new mind, a new perspective so that you can rise above whatever it is that's going on in your life because you know that you have him. That's how good he is. 
That's how powerful he is. So that no matter what's happening in your life, you can be unstoppable and unshakable and incorruptible and unoffendable and imperturbable. You can be immovable because you're connected to the one who is. That's our hope. And when I say and teach that we need to be, we need to liberate people, we got to do it by being the salt and the light. We got to do it by being these covenant bearing people who go out and show everybody what it's like to live in the covenant. We share the terms. We tell them how it works. And when we do that, we'll change the world one area at a time. Amen. Let me pray for us. Jesus, we thank you for your truth, your word. We thank you that it's so clear. We thank you that it's so powerful. We thank you that it transforms hearts and lives. God, we thank you that in you, there's freedom. It says, wherever the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So I just pray for everybody watching right now, every home represented, that your spirit, your presence, your freedom would be there. And that as you liberate that home, as you work in that home, it would have a chain reaction effect in the homes all around them. God, that it would, it would start a movement of freedom for people all over the United States and the world. Jesus, I pray for each of us to take seriously our call, our mandate, our identity in you as the salt and light, and that we'd be forever changed and the world would be a better place for it. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. God bless you.